There they are. Yeah, land back. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> Yeah, you because know, we did that. You know, we climbed Mount Rushmore two years in a row, you know, and they drug us off and land back. You know, this is our land. We're the only ones that have title to the Black Hills, you know. And uh, no one's going to know about it unless we make it known, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. So, yeah, of course, land back. That goes way back, you know, even before my title. Uh, Hamadakiapi, Tabloka Wakita Amachapi. My name is Nick Tilson. Uh, my Lakota name is Looking Buffalo Bull. I'm Lakota, Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and uh, I'm the host of the Land Back for the People podcast, uh, hosted and produced here by an uh, awesome team here at Indian Collective. Big shout out to Willie White and Steph Vieira who are helping put on this podcast. I come into this recognizing that we that there's a movement of the of the times of now and that the land back movement is the red power movement of our generation and that as being somebody who was raised up in the American Indian movement by parents who were active in the movement um, and active in fighting for Mother Earth and active for fighting for, for the rights of the people, I continued on those, those things. And I watch all throughout Indian country all these amazing indigenous people that are rising up fighting for Mother Earth, rising up fighting for their lands, rising up fighting for their rights, and they do are doing so as you know, powerful indigenous communities. And so it's my honor to be able to host people on this podcast and to have conversation uh, about this, you know, this movement that is fighting for uh, the liberation of our people and our homelands. And so excited to continue to have many guests come on to this podcast over the coming months and with any luck over the coming years. I'm also a father of four wild Oglala kids and uh, both live still on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and also in the, in the Chesapa in the Black Hills. So yes, we did it. Uh, we started a podcast. <laughs> we started a land back podcast uh, that is about the land back movement. That is about this revolutionary movement that is spreading throughout uh, the indigenous world. And this podcast, Land Back for the People, it's about the land and about the people and those who are leading this movement, those who are throwing down to protect Mother Earth, those who are rising up against corporations that are out here to erode our rights and to pollute the waters of our homelands. This podcast is about making sure that we continue to have the conversations about the liberation of our people and our homelands. And that there is no true liberation unless we begin to dismantle many of the systems that were put in place, that were designed to oppress our people, that were designed to push our people down. And it so happens to be that land is at the cross intersections of all of these issues. It's at the cross intersection of the environmental justice movement. It is at the cross intersection of the conservation movement. It's at, it's at the cross intersection of the climate movement. It's at the cross intersection of the human rights movement. In fact, it's at the crux of even the economic conversation happening of how do we build new economies that aren't just takers, economies that continue to destroy Mother Earth when and give rights to corporations over people. Well, the people are rising up. That is no doubt that that is happening. And this movement is built on the shoulders of people who have sacrificed their freedoms. It is built on a foundation of people fighting for land returned for generations. 
It is built on the the foundation and the shoulders of our ancestors who continue to fight for our language, who continue to fight for our ways of life, who continue to fight for Mother Earth. And the land back movement is on a continuum of, of, of indigenous resistance. I want to make it really clear, land back in this movement did not come from a think tank. It did not come from a marketing company. It didn't come from places far away from the issues that we're faced with. Land back came from the front line. It came from those of us who have been beaten by police, those who have been rising up against corporations, those of us who put our lives at risk for there to be a movement for this to happen today. And those north of the medicine line who've been rising up to protect their indigenous rights uh, in so-called Canada, to our relatives in the south and Mexico. So on this podcast, we will have real talk about the state of this movement. We'll have conversations with our elders and the next generation of folks that are coming. And in this first podcast, being right here, you know, coming from Osheti Shakoi lands, coming right here from Mini Luzaha, coming right here from the, the Chesapa in the Black Hills. I couldn't think of a better um, of a better guest to have than, than Tui uh, Madonna Thunderhawk, who is a matriarch of our communities and our people. Uh, she jokingly says that she's like the Forrest Gump of indigenous resistance because she's literally been at almost every focal point of indigenous resistance for the past 55 years. From the takeover of the BIA headquarters to the Trail of Broken Treaties, to Alcatraz Island, to all of the occupations of Mount Rushmore, to the siege at Wounded Knee, and to Standing Rock, and to many of the, the struggles happening today, she's still there. And, and so I want to give it over to her to an opportunity to introduce yourself uh, to, to the listeners. All right, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I mean podcast, you know, that to me that's just like exciting. Um, and it's happening right here, you know, within our, with Indian Collective, all these young people, you know, our own studio. I'm sitting in a studio, you know. <laughs> it's just awesome. Uh, it, you know, and for someone at my age and gone, you know, all these decades of struggle and you name it, uh, this is a big deal for me. Because we didn't have this. This is only things we, mm. we thought might happen someday in the future. When I was young, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't, there's nothing. There was no native press. There was no, there's, you know, it was just a uh, struggle, you know. And so, yeah, it, it's all positive for me. And, I, and I'm really uh, happy to be here. And I'm, I'm glad that I get to be a part of this because I think what we need to hopefully... <laughs> There's our people that are listening. You know, we need to. Um, it's important that we we tell our own stories. And, uh, <laughs> what happened, you know, in our in our days of resistance, for like what happened when I was young, you know, and and how uh, it, it's carried carried me through my my entire uh, adult life, you know, uh, the resistance and and um, it's just it's part of who we are. That's kind of generalizing, but but basically that's what it is because our history stands for us. Mm. And there's many things that we are so unique here in the United States. There's so many things that status that we have that nobody else in this country has. I don't care how much money they pile up. I don't care how you know religious some people are, you know. Uh, they don't have what we have because we are indigenous. We are of this land. And we're the only ones that can say that. We're the only ones in this country that can say we are never homeless. Houseless, yes, at times, Mm -hmm. but never, ever homeless. Mm. We are of this land. So land back is that carries a lot of history and a lot of hope. So I, I love that saying, land back. 
So yeah, let's jump into it. Uh, let, let's jump into it here. Um, you know, being being at almost every modern indigenous land back or land struggle, I should say, um, you know, over the past 50, 60 years, like, why do you think it's so important? Why do you think it's so important um, that we continue to fight for the return of our lands? And why is it important to you personally? Well, I th- for me personally, it's, it's, um, it started out for me when I was young and everything was, resistance was brand new in the late 60s, you know, early 70s. It was the fact that our, we, we were learning, because we weren't, sure weren't learning it in school or any kind of history written about our people, uh, but we were learning um, from our elders who were raised by grandparents who had memory of the Battle of Little Bighorn Mm. That's how close our history is to us. And they were the ones that brought us along, and everything was new to me, the history of our people. But one of the things that I personally saw and was aware of the where I grew up on my reservation is now underwater, and that mm. was close to a million acres of the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation when our shoreline went underwater for the Awahe Dam. Mm-hmm. So I, I saw that happen. I watched that. So I think that had a lot of effect on me, mm. um, along with everything else and, and the elders that brought us along and, and educated us and said, you know, woke us up, you know, and, and said, here's your history. Here's, here's what's really going on, you know. And, um, yeah, there's all these services that are available through IHS and, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and, but many and many of the those came about because of our ratified treaty rights that our ancestors made with the federal government. And the federal government, so that the treaty right, treaty provisions wouldn't get the credit that they deserve, they made it countrywide for every reservation, whether they had tr- treaties or not. Here's the services we are giving to you, mm-hmm. you know, and... Um, so I, that was awakening for me to learn this history of our own people and our ancestors. So um, it, it's an individual thing, but it's also, I believe, comes from strong families. Mm. Because it was uh, one of my mentors at the time. Um, her name was uh, Yetzi Blue. She's uh, Tulalip from the west, western coast. And um, Janet McLeod. And she told me, she said, Madonna, we are no longer strong nations of people, indigenous, but we are strong families, and these strong families are holding it down mm-hmm. in every Indian territory and in, in, in communities, these strong families are holding it down. So I thought, you know, again, there, there you go, you know, so stop looking at the negative and look at the positive, you know. So you are responsible because each generation has a responsibility. It isn't something that you decide, oh, well, I want to be a good Indian, so I'm going to you know, carry a sign sometimes. Mm-hmm. No, it, it, it has, has a lot more to do with whether you take on that responsibility because that's what it is. It's mm-hmm. a responsibility. And uh, everybody takes that responsibility in different ways. Like the young people, for example, that are in this building, Native Collective building, sitting in the heart of Rapid City, you know, South Dakota. It's what they do, they show up every day and the work that they're doing, to me, that's resistance. That's just as important, you know, as as putting your body on the line on a mm-hmm. blockade or someplace. You know, everything mm-hmm. is important for for us to to maintain who we are. So, so when you started, so here's a question: When you started hearing, I mean, you, you've been around for a long time. You've seen activists come and go, you know, slogans <laughs> come and go. You know, you've seen a lot come and go. When young people started saying like "land back." When you started hearing like younger ones say "land back," like what what was your reaction to that? Like, what did you think when when you started hearing people like "land back" all like in one word, you know? Yeah. Like, what was your reaction to that? My reaction, well, was my sister and I was like, "There they are, yeah, land back." 
Hello, you know. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> Yeah, you because know, we did that. You know, we climbed Mount Rushmore two years in a row, you know, and they drug us off and land back. You know, this is our land. We're the only ones that have title to the Black Hills, you know. And uh, no one's going to know about it unless we make it known, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what we did. So, yeah, of course, land back. That goes way back, you know, even before my time. So, so whenever... Um so now, like, whenever you, somebody walks up to you on the street and, or on the res or at mm-hmm. a powwow or at a ride, wherever, and, sa- and says, what does land back mean to you? What would be your, what would be your, like, response to that? Oh, I have lots of responses, but, you know, I mean, it, it depends on who's asking it, you know. Uh, if it's a non-native, I'll say, you know, well, yeah, land back means the United States starts obeying their own laws, mm. you know. The uh, fr- fraudulent laws or, or policies on how to uh, legally take our land, legal in their eyes, you know, but illegal in ours. Mm-hmm. I mean, but if it's a native person, they would say, come on, you know, that's what our ancestors did. So you and I can be walking around here, you know. So now it's our turn. It's our time. So you mentioned Mount Rushmore, and uh, there's been various different protests throughout history at Mount Rushmore. Uh, you've led and participated in some. So have I. What, for you, like, why was that symbolism? Like the first time you ever went to Mount Rushmore and protested there, what was the symbolism? Uh, why was it important to make a political stance there at Mount Rushmore? Of all the places to make, you know, a political stance, why was that important there, right, at Mount Rushmore, you know, in the Black Hills? Well, you know, for me, it was it was kind of like automatic reaction because I remember when I was 13 years old, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Mabel Arcon, she's from the Yankton Reservation. And she was working uh, with the uh, 4-H organization and they had a camp in the Black Hills. And she was uh, there, on, I don't know, teaching, I don't know, whatever, beadwork, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, um, and this is back in the 50s. I mean, like I'm 13 years old, you know. So um, she um, wanted me to come and stay because one of her uncles was coming and his name was Standing Bear. And he was from the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, but he was going to come and spend some time. Um, And she was living in Custer then, so she said, so if you're here, then you can make sure, you know, because, you know, he was elderly. And she said, you know, he might wander off or, you know, the door might... You know, make sure the doors aren't locked and, you know, stuff like that. You know, kind of watch out for him. So I said, okay, fine. And I was excited. You know, oh, I get to go to Black Hills, you know, hang out with my grandma. Um, well, he ended up talking English and Indian to me and telling me about the Black Hill, uh, about Mount Rushmore. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, I just wanted to listen to, the, well, back in the day, radio is all we had, a rock and roll, you know. And I was thinking, oh, you know, doing the dishes and stuff. And then, but he was you know, wanting to talk. So then, of course, being respectful, because that's what you're taught. So I, I was listening to him, and he said, all right, he was there because he was visiting uh, Crazy Horse Mountain. And uh, Jokowski, the guy that was carving it, was alive then. So he said, I go and I visit with him every now and then, because he was one of the group of men that went to Jokowski and asked him to, to carve Crazy Horse in response to the Mount Rushmore, because they did not want those four faces, of Mount Rushmore carved on them on, in, in the hills. So he said that was what they did to you know, mm-hmm. as a, because of that. So he explained all that to me. And at the time, I didn't know, I didn't care. I mean, I could care less. I wanted to listen to, you know, rock and roll music on the radio. I mean, but he taught me, you know, and I was, I listened and I heard that. So when the time came. 
you know, that in the early 70s, I think it was 1970, we, when we first went up Mount Rushmore, what, everything he told me came back. Mm. And that's why I went. And I told everybody there, that's why, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I relate to that too, because I think that like symbols matter in society. You know, symbols matter in society. And I think that, you know, the Black Hills being one of the longest existing, you know, legal battles for land in the United States to have Mount Rushmore carved into this sacred place is like the biggest sort of sign of disrespect that somebody could have. And so I know that like as a young organizer watching and looking at historical video, looking at historical pictures of the um, actions that happened up there, the, the messaging was so strong. And that's one thing I always really like appreciated about your generation and the American Indian movement was it, ch it chose to, to protest at s places because of the symbolism of the injustice that ha happened there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that always like stuck true to me because it, it made it translatable to me, you know, as a young organizer. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I can relate to that. I can relate to that as a symbol of injustice. You know, mm -hmm. and it kind of, you know, pisses you off. And I think that, like, uh, I think that, I think that in order to organize, I think you got to get a little pissed off sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I appreciate that. I appreciate those, uh, the the teachings of why to protest at certain places, um, particularly when it comes to land. Um, before we transition, um you were at Alcatraz. You were at the takeover of the BIA. You were at Wounded Knee. You were at the protest at Mount Rushmore. You were at Standing Rock. Um, what have you seen like in the evolution of the indigenous people's fight for, for land back? Uh, how have you seen things change over time in strategies and tactics um, that people are taking? It isn't so much, I don't think that I thought of, of the change so much as I thought, well, it's their time. Hmm. So when you say, like when we talk, you know, about things like this, you know, different elders that we get together, when we say things like, well, it's their time, that means a whole lot. That means everything. Mm. Times are different. The mindset of the entire country is different than it was back when we were young, you know. So that covers all of it when you say, well, it's their time, you mm. know. We, can, we know what we're talking about. So, uh, and how, how it's, it's interesting to see how each group, and I think we look at, we don't look at it but generations like the rest of the country does. Our people don't think of it that way. At least we don't as elders, you know. So um, a generation to me is like your lifespan, you know, from the little ones to the elders that are in within your your mm -hmm. lifetime, you know. So it's just that the age group, you know, it's, it's their time and how they deal with it. And now it's just amazing for me to, uh, because of the social media that's available and all the technology. I mean, good grief. I mean, what did we have? We didn't have nothing. You know, we didn't even have... I mean, you didn't even, I mean, there was telephone system, but if you didn't have long distance, I mean, you might as well not have it, you know? So, and we didn't have any kind of a media, you know, it was just word of mouth and gatherings. So it was really important that we moved around and gathered, you know? But nowadays you don't have to do that. You can have stu studios like this, you know, mm -hmm. in the media and it's, it's so amazing. And and I just think that each each age group takes takes whatever's, within their time, you know, and, and utilize it. And there was, a, there was a dry spell there, you know, where things kind of slowed down and I was looking around thinking, wait a minute, you know, where is everybody, you know? The issues are still here, things are still moving, but time will surface. Things will surface when it's their time, you know? Yep. So you just regroup and you work with your grandchildren and you... you let, you know, work, work on the community level until those things start popping. So when your people are ready, things will move. 
We're just kind of waiting for you to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, Steph Vieira here, associate producer with Indian Collective. I really hope you're enjoying the Land Back for the People podcast. I know I am. <laughs> but today I'm here to tell you about this amazing funding opportunity with Indian Foundation. And that would be the Community Self-Determination Grant. So, in case you didn't know, this is an unprecedented opportunity that invests in the long-term visions of Indigenous nations and our communities by fostering community-based solutions and Indigenous decision-making. Grant awards are provided to tribal nations, communities, and orgs that are most aligned with Indian Collective's vision and strategies of defend, develop, and decolonize with a commitment to building Indigenous power. Indian Foundation will accept letters of interest beginning April 2023, and they must be submitted by May 2nd of this year. Community self-determination grant selections are expected to be made by August 2023, with grant terms beginning September 1st, 2023. So if you'd like to learn more information or you just want to visit our cool website, please visit grants.indiancollective.org. Thanks. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So we're gonna talk a little bit. You know, we're we're here uh, at Indian Collective headquarters. Uh, we're in Mini Luzaha, which to the listeners out there, you know, Mini is water, Luzaha is swift or rapid. It. I always like to remind people. I'm like, this is Mini Luzaha, aka Rapid City, mm-hmm. um, because this town was named after what our people called this town. It was named after the watershed, you know, that comes through the the, the Chesapa. Um, and it, you know, informs, but also the struggle for the Black Hills uh, in, the, in the Chesapa is one of the longest existing legal battles in the history of the United States. You know, it started with the Treaty of 1851 and 1868, um, and then there was the taking of the, the, of the land in 1877, um, and then there was the Supreme Court decision in 1980 that said the, the, the Black Hills, in fact, was a violation of the U.S. Constitution and one of the most gross violations in the history of the United States Constitution. But we're not going to return the land. We're going to pay just compensation for pennies on the dollar of mm-hmm. something we never wanted to, you know. And today we stand united against accepting you know, resources uh, from something that they stole from us. Um, but the struggle for the Black Hills continues. And um, and so for you, like, why, why are the Black Hills so important? Why are the Black Hills as sort of a cornerstone of the indigenous people's struggle? Why is it so important to you personally? And why do you think it's import- important to the whole movement? Well, just growing up with the thinking, you know, uh, that I've heard since the time I was young is that the Black Hills, you know, belong to us, um, belongs to our people. And there wasn't that much detail, you know, I just grew up hearing that, you know. And um, different times we'd hear people make kind of, you know, in a joking way like, you know, Doksha. Black Hills. In other words, when they pay us off, you know, then I'll pay you back. You know that type of thing. <laughs> so it was kind of Doksha Black Hills. <laughs> Doksha Black Hills. You know? So we kind of grew up with that kind of, uh, you know, knowledge. You know, in a kind of a, I don't know, wasn't really taken that serious because we didn't think there would ever be a time when, when that would happen, or that would even be uh, something to actually talk about like we're doing now is related to treaty rights and treaty violations. So, um, but also the fact that it's where our people originated. Mm. It's very, very sacred ground because this is where we come from, you know? Um, We're star nation and then went underground for survival and then that's where we came came out from. So I think that that is a kind of, um, because we're still land-based to a certain extent, the reservations, 
Uh, we still, as a people, we still have that connection. So I think it's just kind of, a lot of times it's kind of automatic that our people react. Because even though they don't know details or they don't talk about it that much, they grew up hearing about it. Mm. You know, and um, it's just, it's just uh, blood memory, you know, ancestral memory really says a lot for us about why we are and what we do. We don't have to be convinced that we should resist and maintain. Mm -hmm. It's who we are. That's absolutely true. So I always like, uh, as an organizer, I always like to, I always like to hear war stories. <laughs> I, 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 in, I grew up in Porcupine sitting at the bottom of the stairs at my mom and dad's old place. There's the wood stove over here. There was the kitchen table here. And I used to, uh, this is the same thing. It was before we had phones and all this. We yeah. had two channels, I think, on the res. <laughs> and usually they were soap operas. Yeah. Um, but I would sit on the edge of the stairs, you know, and I would listen to everybody as they would come through. And my favorite was like listening to battles, war stories uh, about times that we won. Yeah. Because uh, I was always trying to grab on to something of like victory. You know, yeah. not just stories of fighting, but f stories of winning. Uh, and uh, so I'd like you to share a little bit about the story of yourself, along with many others, um, in the Black Hills Alliance days, where people bound together here uh, and actually successfully uh, kicked the Union Carbide Corporation out of the Black Hills and stopped uranium mining in the Black Hills. Um, you know, a lot of times we have a victory and then we check the box and go keep going to work. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of create some space for you to reflect on that battle uh, and uh, what made it unique and how you how you were how, how you all were able to wage that a successful battle against that corporation right here in the Black Hills. Well, you know, the whole idea of the Black Hills Alliance, I mean, the, the name speaks for itself. It was an alliance, you know, of Native and non-Native people. Um, and it just, and of course we had Bruce Allison, you know, attorney. I mean, that's always, that was amazing, you know, that Doesn't we had hurt. that legal backing, you know. <laughs> and so it, it was, it, 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 it grew, you know, it started out and it grew and we learned as we went along. But the fact that we were an alliance, I think that's what mm. really helped us because everybody, I mean, we used to have meetings, you know, for hours and hours, but it was interesting. That's why we had them so long because everybody had an opinion and we could bounce off of each other and learn from each other. It was really, really important, you know. So we had, with the alliance, we had, you know, different, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Ways of, of, of attacking the issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, going into court was one of them, you know, and we said, okay, how is the most effective way? And the thing about the alliance was not only individuals, but it was families, especially families from the different reservations, Pine Ridge Reservation, Cheyenne River, and Standing Rock. So, for example, my sister and uh, my brother-in-law, they were, uh, what do you call it, when they sign on to the lawsuit? Uh, plaintiffs? Yeah, they yep. were plaintiffs, yeah. For, for example, you know, among others. So that was the strength, I think, of, of, of any, any issue that we did, you know, from, I mean, we had some of the largest, biggest, you know, uh, gatherings and, and, um, of people in the Black Hills was the Black Hills Alliance. I mean, we had, you know, five mile, you know, blocking a highway, just marching down the road, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands, you know, people came from all over the country because it was the era of the no-nukes after mm -hmm. they had the meltdown and what was that, Love Canal in the east, eastern part of the United States, you know, and a big, they realized that all this... Oh, Three know, Mile Island, yeah. Three Mile Island, yeah, yep. Love Canal, Duwali. Anyway, <laughs> Three Mile, <laughs> getting them mixed up. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so that was, it was, a, it was a time, you know, the time was... Was was good at the you know and because we were an alliance, we had, we we had alliances with organizations all over the country, 
not only other tribes that were fighting, you know, environmental issues, but also n no nukes groups around the country. So it was just, it was an amazing time, you know. And so, yeah, we went into court, you know, and what we found out, that was a real good tactic because these corporations, when they come in, the exploratory, you know, get permits like that. They have a timeline of when they're going to start making their millions, billions, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's all about money. So once they're not making money, they're going to pull out. The investors want money. They don't care about issues or anything else. They just want money, you know. So you slow them down. You, you do all these other, you know, things get in their way, you know, where they can't start mining and selling then you slow them down and pretty soon eventually they leave because they're all about money. When they're not making money, you know, and it's sad because they end up going somewhere else to some other indigenous population in India or someplace else, you know. But you just do what you can, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's always good because you're, we're indigenous and Mother Earth is always first. Well, you, yeah, you hit it right here, you know. You hit the pocketbook of the corporations as one way to take them down. Yeah. You know, I bring this up because, you know, here, here it is. We're in years, you know, 2023. Right now, you know, of the entire Black Hills, there's 233,000 acres or one in every five acres right now in the Black Hills is undermining claims. Yes. And you, whether they be gold, uranium, Lithium, lithium, precious metals, and we're seeing all of the. It's it's really some of the same old actors that have always mm -hmm. come to extract our resources here, uh, but just in new names, yeah. new new LLCs and new corporations, but the same old business and the same old lies. Mm -hmm. And um, this is helpful for for people in my generation to hear that uh, to remind like. They're big because they're only motivated by money. It becomes their biggest vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It becomes the biggest. It's, it's the way to take down, you know. It's the way to take down some of the biggest corporations in the world is to affect their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And this is where, of course, organizing matters. Uh, you know, hitting the pocketbook matters. And you know, just just last week, you know, we've been fighting. Uh, gold exploration and gold mining here in the Black Hills. Um, and just last week, uh, there's a proposal from the Bureau of Land Management to um, to do a mineral, a mineral withdrawal from the entire Rapid Creek watershed, which which is wonderful because it's basically yeah. kicking out the, the mining corporations potentially for the next 20 years. Um, and... Uh, but but there's still more work to be done. And uh, I think that one of the lessons that you're sharing here is the importance of having alliances, the importance of maybe maybe there's some people you don't agree with on every issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure back in the Black Hills Alliance days and the Cowboys <laughs> and Indian Alliance yeah. days, you didn't agree on every every issue. But how did you wade through... You know, the fact that you might not agreed on every issue, but you agreed on this one. How did you navigate that? How did you, uh, how, how did you, yeah, weed through that at the time? We just stayed focused. We stayed focused on the, 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 um, the main issue that why people gathered in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And everything else, we just didn't, we just didn't, didn't, uh, participate in, in, in any discussions that were, you know, that veered off, you know, from the, we kept our, our eye on the issue and, and kept our focus so that, then that way people didn't feel like they had to constantly be, you know, uh, telling their side of the story or, or, you know, defending their position or anything because we just removed all that and we mm. just made it, and and it worked because a lot of times, well, you know how our people are. You know, we're not always talking and, you know, everybody interrupting each other and stuff, you know. <laughs> Usually, it's, you know, there's got to be an agenda. Otherwise, there's nobody talking, you know. <laughs> nobody starts out. So that's one of the things with an alliance that the non-natives learned is that if you disagree with somebody, you don't have to sit there and just, 
you know, try to talk mm. them down. You just don't say anything. And then mm. it's quiet, so then you move on to what's really important, you know, the issue, the main issue why we're all here, you know. So, it, you know, we learned as we went along, but, uh, and after a while it was comfortable with people, you know. People showed up and it was just, you know, because they knew they weren't going to be uh, singled out or anything, you know. It, yeah. was, it was just... That's a good reminder. I mean, I think that we're living, uh, our generation is living in like polarizing times where we're so stuck in our, we, we, you know, we get stuck in our one issue and everybody that we work with has to be in the same politics mm-hmm. as all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is, you know, to, to, to move mountains and to build movements, we have to, we have to meet places, you know. And so yep. it's, a, it's a good reminder for us to hear that. Um, especially in the times that we're in today. Um, so all across the indigenous world and Indian country, and I've been able to travel all over the place. Every, I, I, now I see land back all over. Land back. When do we want it? Now, <laughs> yeah. land back. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, because it speaks to the heart, you know. Mm-hmm. This, it speaks to the heart of what we're fighting for, you know, our future and our past. And... um what would be like your message to the next generation um, that's coming up behind you and to young people all over fighting for land back? What, what would be your main message to them? I think it's really important that everybody remember that you're only responsible for, for yourself as far as change or or how you think and that know your issue if you're interested no find out you know do do your homework and then however that works out for you then that tells you what your commitment's going to be so you don't have to go by anybody else's blueprint mm-hmm. and you know what else you you're indigenous. Your ancestors done took care of everything for you already by their sacrifice and what they did. You don't need anybody's permission. Mm-hmm. Just know what you're talking about and get organized. And start out with yourself. Because once you have that, then knowledge is power. And Pretty soon you'll look around, you know, and and, and you're surrounded by people that think like you and act like, you know, on issues. So, yeah, it's it's, it's real simple. Keep it simple, you know. I appreciate that. Um, Again, we're sitting here with Madonna Thunderhawk, um, you know, warrior, uh, warrior woman and matriarch that has been here for... uh, 50 to 60 years fighting for our land and um, guiding us. And um, you can actually, there's a, I want to do a, a shameless plug. There's a project <laughs> called Warrior Women Project. And the purpose of this uh, project was to remind, I, I would say remind the world that <laughs> indigenous struggles were never possible without the matriarchs. Um the American Indian movement would have never happened if it wasn't the matriarchs. Many of these actions they have been a part of that shifted policy forever uh, would have never been possible without women. And the uh, Warrior Women Project brings to light those stories. Um, and you can, actually, you can actually go to warriorwomen.org and learn more about the project um, and uh, watch the film. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a chance to say anything about that project and that film uh, before we close out for the for the day. Well, <laughs> there's a lot I have to say about it, but basically it's just, um, you know, uh, women's voices were not heard for so many decades, you know, and now is the time and we're able to do it ourselves. We have the resources and the know-how and uh, it's it's really important that we we uh, do it ourselves. We don't have to depend on anyone else to tell our story. Like when I was growing up, when I was young, we didn't have these resources. We had to depend on non-native everything, you know? But now we, we have the resources and we're able to do it. 
So we need we need to do that. And not only that, but the archives are so important because many of the, the mm. interviews we have with Warrior Women's Project are are uh, interviews of our archives of women of the the matriarchs of the 60s and 70s, and especially for Wounded Knee and the, the negotiating team that negotiated with the, with the, the White House, the majority of them were women, they were mm -hmm. matriarchs. But you don't read that or hear about that anywhere unless we do it. That's why at the 50 year anniversary, we did a, a banner project of, of these women, mm -hmm. their voices, you know, they get, because the interviews were done. Mm -hmm. While they were still here, you know, and they're in the star camps now, you know, but their their uh, descendants, their great grandchildren, can he see their face and hear their voice. So. Yeah, so check it out, um, WarriorWomen dot org. It's a great documentary. It's a great project. It continues to uh, travel throughout Indian country and some of the schools. Um, and you can find more information about that at Warrior Women. Uh, dot org. Um, we're going to wrap up here um, with the first uh, first episode of the Land Back for the People podcast. Um, and as we close out, I always like to remember the the people, like a reminder to the people that you're you're a part of a movement that is connected through the ancestors that's connected through the land. Um, and every single time that we participate in the fighting for land, we're making a commitment to those things. We're making a commitment to the ancestors. We're waking them up. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we're taking on our collective responsibility. And uh, to the generation that is coming up, this newer, ge newer generation, I think that Sometimes we are feel often like we are waiting for permission. But to sit here across from you in this, uh, one of the matriarchs of our entire movement to say, uh, don't wait for permission. It is already your responsibility um, is, is powerful to hear. And for everybody that's listening out there, I think it's important that you remember that, that you put that into action, that you... Take the moment to realize that you already have the ability to act now, that you don't have to wait. There is no some savior coming to mm -hmm. save you, um, but that we have a collective responsibility. Uh, you heard it right here on the Land, Land Back podcast, and you heard it from one of our matriarchs, Madonna Thunderhawk. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Ta-da! We're done. Yay. Woohoo. First one in the bag. In the bag. In the bag. <laughs> hey, relatives. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Land Back for the People podcast, episode one. If you like this first episode, please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for future episodes. If you want to put us in your pocket next time, take us with you. Then you can find us wherever you tune into your podcast. And don't forget to follow Indian Collective on all of our social media platforms to stay in touch with us. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope to see you in the next one. Bye, everyone.